Leaders like Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez have championed all of this crap that's prioritized gender identity over reality, self-empowerment over moral responsibility, emotional fragility over free speech. And by advancing all of this, the Democratic Party is complicit in the downfall of America. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast where we prod the sheep and beat the wolf. This is episode 134, sixth reason why voting Democrat is a sin, feminism. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. I am so glad that you're here today, whether you're new or you're a returning listener or you're joining us for the first time. I am so glad that you're here. Every single like and share and subscription and comment that you leave is helping us get this message out to more people. So I want to say thank you so much for that. And I want to give a special shout out to all of the podcast members, including our prod squad members. Thank you so much much for joining as members of the show. You are keeping us in the fight, keeping us strong, and keeping us going. So thank you so much. Like I said last time, if you're not currently giving to a local church, then don't join the prod squad. But if you're giving to a local church and if you want to support what we're doing here, then go ahead. We will accept it. Now, if you're not a member and you'd like to do that, then just go to our YouTube channel and you can join the community. You can click on the membership tab and then you can get all access to all sorts of perks and bonus content and all of that uh, that'll be head, that'll be coming in the weeks ahead. But with that, go do that. Go become a member. But with that. Let us get into today's episode. If you've been here, you will know that we've been in a series called 10 Reasons Why Voting Democrat is a Sin. And we've been able to cover a couple topics so far in this series, like climate change or critical race theory or sex education or today or this last week, open borders. Well, today we're going to be diving into reason number six, which is feminism and just you know, trigger warning, this is probably one of the most controversial issues in American Christianity because we've drifted so far from the biblical view of what woman is that when you start claiming what the Bible says about a woman, then, well, you're a bigot or you're a misogynist or you're a cult leader or all sorts of other things. Now, in today's episode, we're going to unpack how all this went awry through the history of feminism. And we're going to do that by talking about its early stages and how it's, it's basically morphed into this, this behemoth movement that has now plunged itself into insanity. We're also going to be looking at the biblical case for what a woman is. And we're going to be looking at scripture to define that because the Bible is the only place where we can get a definition about what a woman is because the one who wrote the Bible is the designer of woman. So with that, let us dive in and let us dismantle this demonic doctrine called feminism. Part one, the history of feminism. First wave feminism. Now, first wave feminism is often idealized as this noble crusade for women's rights. But, you know, back in those days, women were treated poorly. And now first wave feminism shows up to right all the wrongs. And it's frequently presented in history as this pivotal movement in Western civilization. However, what is often ignored about first wave feminism is its dark underbelly, this, the darker side of this movement. It didn't merely seek justice, but it actually fundamentally subverted God's divine order of creation. It undermined the societal foundations that have stood for centuries, and it caused all sorts of problems that eventually would work themselves out later. First wave feminism was like the acorn to an unholy tree. It eventually would grow up and it would cause all of its damage, but it started in seed form here. Now, First wave feminism began by challenging patriarchal structures, structures that had been biblically ordained, and it ignited a social and a spiritual revolution with destructive and far reaching consequences. At the heart of first wave feminism was a rejection of the divinely ordained role of men and of women, as outlined in Holy Scripture. God created man and woman with a distinct purpose. We see that in Genesis 2, 18 through 24 and Ephesians 5, 22 through 33. 
And God appointed the man as the head of the household, and he appointed the woman as his complimentary helpmate. Now, feminists, however, saw the structure as oppressive, and they sought to dismantle it. Leaders like Elizabeth Cady Stanton in her Women's Bible in 1895 openly challenged biblical authority and sought to reinterpret scripture, kind of like Thomas Jefferson, in a way that denied male headship and made a Bible that suited her fancy. Stanton and other early feminists rejected the biblical order of submission and headship and undermining she, didn't, she undermined not just the gender roles, but the authority of God himself. This rebellion echoed the desire for autonomy that we see in Genesis 3, 5, which is the serpent who led Eve originally into all sorts of sin, which led to humanity's fall. Now, one of the most damaging outcomes of first wave feminism was its assault on the family. Early feminist figures like Susan B. Anthony and Margaret Sanger, yes, you heard it right, Margaret Sanger, advocated for women to pursue careers outside of the traditional family unit. Sanger, in particular, argued for a woman's right to control her own body. A right to control her body, a concept that laid the groundwork for the eventual legalization of abortion. The home, designed by God as the primary sphere for women to nurture and raise the next generation, was devalued. In the name of empowerment, women were removed from the home and they were sent out into the workforce to compete with men, destabilizing the family and society as we know it. Now, as more women were encouraged to leave the home for work, children who were once raised by their mothers were now increasingly left to the care of institutions, whether it be public school systems or daycares. The traditional family, the bedrock of society, began to crumble. The movement also promoted a dangerous philosophy of self-glorification or autonomy. Feminists like Stanton and Susan B. Anthony prioritized individual rights and ambitions above the family and above the community and above God. What started as a plea for the rights of women quickly became a justification for self-indulgence, which paved the way for later sexual liberation and licentiousness. Now, Scripture teaches that self-sacrifice and submission are biblical principles that are in direct opposition to the feminist pursuit of autonomy. But first wave feminism went on lurching ahead, and its legacy is seen in the chaos that it's left in its wake. What began with demands for suffrage culminated in the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920 and soon evolved into a broader rebellion against God's created order. The pursuit of equal property rights and suffrage, though legal in appearance, was not without spiritual consequences. Its later impact is evident in movements such as the sexual revolution, the widespread acceptance of abortion through Roe v. Wade in 1973, and the erosion of traditional gender roles, all of which find their roots in this fundamental revolt. As feminism rose, Western civilization declined. That's not a matter of subjective opinion. That is a matter of history. With women leaving their homes to pursue careers, the family disintegrated, fertility rates plummeted, the church lost its influence in the world, and secular society crumbled. Now, ultimately, first wave feminism paved the way for more radical forms of feminist ideology that were coming later, which emerged in the 1960s through the movement called second wave feminism. What began as a movement for legal rights began an all-out war against God and established a, a new kind of order and a new kind of revolution that put woman above God. Second wave feminism. Now, building on the groundwork laid by first wave feminism, the second wave of the 1960s took the rebellion against God's order to an even greater level. While first wave feminism had focused primarily on legal equality, such as voting rights and property ownership, the second wave rapidly expanded its agenda to include a full scale assault on society's morals and society's structures. What initially appeared to be a movement for workplace equality and reproductive rights evolved into a campaign against the Bible and against traditional biblical values. 
resulting in the second wave feminist embrace of sexual liberation and radical individualism, which undermined more of the family unit than first wave ever dreamed of and created even more societal instability than before. What was framed as liberation enslaved women in a new kind of bondage, a kind of bondage characterized by selfishness, societal decay, spiritual decline, and all sorts of other things. At its core, second wave feminism rejected God and his view of femininity. Traditional roles as wives and mothers and homemakers previously respected and even admired in the community were now viewed as repressive and unnecessary, almost like the handmade tales. This movement championed by figures like Betty Friedan marked a sharp departure from the early feminist goals. Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique in 1963 became a defining manifesto portraying homemakers as uneducated, uninformed, unfulfilled, and soul crushed people. And she promoted as a, as a antidote to that repressive uh, homemaking lifestyle, career over family as the true path to personal fulfillment. Unlike first wave feminists who argued for basic civil rights, second wave leaders sought to dismantle the family entirely and to take the woman out of her primary sphere and purpose and to move her into competition with men. This marked a significant shift in American life as the family, particularly the woman's nurturing role within it, was directly attacked, outdated, and it was viewed as oppressive. This rebellion was not only against the societal, the societal structures, but against God himself. And scripture teaches that submission to a husband is a good thing. It reflects Christ's relationship with his church. It's a beautiful thing. And yet, second wave feminism convinced an entire generation of women to value autonomy and independence over submission masking rebellion in the language of freedom and choice. And with the rise of leaders like Gloria Steinem, feminism expanded its rhetoric to include the idea that traditional marriage and motherhood were traps that were inhibiting women's freedom and fulfillment. Now, underneath all of this was the eugenics movement, was a globalist movement, and was all sorts of other things that were selling a package of lies to women, but the results were all the same. As the movement growed, it increasingly championed reproductive rights, which led to sexual immorality, which led to more and more abortions. With the right to abortion becoming a central demand in 1973, Roe v. Wade was institutionalized, framing it as a fundamental right of women to murder their babies. Just think about the irony of that statement. The people on earth who are the most loving, most caring, most empathetic, most nurturing have now been taught that it's a fundamental right to kill their own children, which is unconscionable. This decision, although it was framed as a victory for women, was a clear violation of the sixth commandment, was a clear violation of thou shalt not murder, and was a clear affront to the holiness of God. What God designed as a womb, which was supposed to be the safest place on earth, has now become a sarcophagus for millions of babies every single year. Second wave feminism's push for abortion on demand was not only part of its broader attack on the family, but on femininity in general. Key figures like Shulamit Firestone, author of The Dialectic of Sex in 1970, called for the complete dismantling of the nuclear family and even proposed communal child rearing, which we heard a few years back from Hillary Clinton. Basically, anything that Hillary Clinton says, you know it's false. This radical vision saw the family as the primary source of oppression on women and the primary means of escape for her to get out of the family so that she could really be free. The ideas of Firestone alongside of those of Gloria Steinem directly contributed to the rise of single motherhood, increased divorce, orphans, and a host of other issues that increased the dysfunction in our society and led to basically the situation that we're in now. Sexual liberation became another central focus of the movement, glorifying promiscuity and severing sex from its God-given purposes of procreation and marital unity. Women were taught to basically have sex like the most degenerate and depraved men, not good men, not godly men, not, not biblical men, but the most depraved and licentious and disgusting and seedy men. Women were taught to have sex like that so that you have women coming out of college and coming out of their early adulthood with body counts, uh, 
in the hundreds with tattoos, a hundred thousand dollars of student debt broken on every side, 10 abortions that they've committed. And now they're finally ready to enter into marriage, utterly broken with sexually transmitted diseases and the breakdown of monogamy. And you wonder why we have such issues in our marriages today. What feminists heralded as liberation was a noose around the neck of woman. It turned traditional sexual norms into bondage to sin, as Romans 6.16 says. And as women became increasingly disconnected from the biblical vision of marriage, they became increasingly depressed, increasingly lonely, and increasingly broken. Radical individualism further eroded the family and community, and it, women were encouraged to prioritize their personal fulfillment, their personal goals, their personal ambitions above everything else, which was a kind of idolatry that led to misery among women, among men, and among society. It led to weakened marriages. It led to the neglect of children. It led to the disintegration of the community bonds, where first wave feminists argued for women's participation in public life. Second wave feminists reject the home entirely as women's place of greatest fulfillment. What was portrayed as strength became isolation and loneliness as women lost the relationships that actually bring true fulfillment to their lives, family, community, and dependence on God. And in its pursuit of autonomy, second wave feminism rejected all of the biblical truth. It fostered a nihilistic worldview and it left women spiritually and emotionally adrift in a world in competition with men. The seeds of rebellion planted by the first wave feminists had been had bore their bitter fruit now in this second period, and now the chickens had come home to roost. Third and fourth wave feminism. Now, emerging in the 1990s, third wave feminism took the rebellion against God's created order to unprecedented levels. While the first wave fought for legal equality and the second wave for workplace rights and reproductive autonomy, the third wave became a cultural force that denied the very existence of male and female. Prominent feminists in this era, such as Judith Butler, argue that gender is not biologically determined, but socially constructed, introducing the concept of gender fluidity and setting the stage for the transgender movement. Butler's influential work, Gender Trouble, in 1990, questioned the fixed nature of gender, rejecting the biblical truth of Genesis 127 that God made man and woman distinct and complementary in his image. The third wave's outright denial of biological realities paved the way for movements that encouraged individuals to reject their God-given gender. The rise of gender reassignment surgeries and hormonal treatments given to children and chem, uh, chemical castrations given to young boys reflects a culture that has been that has embraced body mutilation as a means of so-called freedom. Do you get the idea that the freedom that feminism offers is slavery? Well, good. That's the right way of thinking. Instead of acknowledging the biblical truth that our identities are found in God's design, third wave feminists have promoted the belief that identity is self-created, that it's created based off of what I believe in my own heart, as deluded as that may be, resulting in a deep crisis of confusion and despair and actually, uh, and, and actually fueling mentally mentally broken people, mentally confused people, mentally abused people, fueling them to make irreparable life altering decisions on their body because they believe that they're a seahorse or a dandelion or a rain cloud or whatever else. These people need counseling. They need therapy. Maybe they need medication. They need a doctor. They don't need a hacksaw chopping off their breast. In addition to the rejection of biology, third wave feminism glorified sexual perversion, even more so than second wave feminism. Promiscuity, pornography, and prostitution were rebranded as forms of empowerment. Instead of calling them prostitutes, now they're sex workers. Movements such as slut walks, which began in 2011 to make people feel uh, empowered and accepted in their whoring apparently sought to these movements sought to challenge societal norms by encourage women to take pride in their sexual promiscuity 
In stark contrast to the biblical teaching on sexual purity, which leads to real freedom, 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20, third wave feminism elevated self, gratification, bodily autonomy, and disgusting sexual practices as the pathway to supposed freedom. And it leads nothing but to, but, but to misery and ruin. This led to a culture that celebrated sexual licentiousness while ignoring its devastating consequences, including the rise of sexually transmitted diseases, the rise of other kinds of diseases, the rise of human trafficking, the normalization of the hookup culture, and the widespread death of millions and millions and millions of babies in the womb. A key component of third wave feminism was the promotion of intersectionality, which is a concept popularized by the legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989. Intersectionality sought to address the overlapping overlapping systems of oppression related to race and gender and class and sexuality. But what it created was a culture of victims because everyone was trying to race to the top of Mount Oppression to find out who was the most oppressed of them all. Feminists began then to divide society into categories of oppressor and oppressed. And of course, it was men who were deemed as the oppressors. So women were the oppressed, which made women constantly feel like victims in this new branded reality that they created. This identity politics rejected biblical virtues such as humility and forgiveness and unity in favor of blame, entitlement, and division. What could go wrong? Society fractured further as third wave feminism encouraged women to see themselves as perpetual victims, further stoking animosity between the sexes, between men and women, and between traditional structures and norms. As third wave feminism dismantled the traditional moral system that was created by our founding fathers that was based on biblical truth, it also sought to silence any opposition. Because how could you dare speak out against our so logical of a framework. Feminists of this era became proponents of censorship using accusations of hate speech, or we actually can speak violence to someone. Like it used to be that violence was when you grabbed a baseball bat and you hit someone over the head. Now I can hurt your little feelings and I have perpetrated violence. Oh my goodness. They, they do this as a way to manipulate people into stifling their views so that you won't speak up against them because nobody wants to be a perpetrator of violence, or at least not most people. So if me hurting your feelings is, is akin to hitting you over the head with a Louisville slugger, <laughs> my goodness, I'm going to shut up and be quiet and never say anything at all. It's foolishness. College campuses with this framework became the battleground for free speech with figures like Christina Hoff, Summers, and Camille Paglia, feminists themselves, facing protest and disruptions for daring to critique feminist orthodoxy. Isn't that incredible? If you're a if you're a feminist and you're critiquing feminism, then you are just as much of a bigot as I am. <laughs> the suppression of debate reflected the movement's inability to withstand any scrutiny whatsoever ever uh, and it it demonstrated the fragility of their own ego and the emptiness of their position that's third wave feminism now we're in a move a little movement called fourth wave feminism which is really a plunging into the final stage of insanity this is as far i think this is as far as it can go before the wheels completely come off now, fourth wave feminism, which sort of emerged in the 2010s, the dates are a little squishy and iffy because it is new and it's uh, and it's like um, an amoeba at this point. It has real no, it, ha it doesn't really have a lot of shape and structure. But in the 2010s, with the advantage of social media and digital platforms to amplify the opinions of anyone, third wave feminism transitioned into fourth wave feminism. With the rise of Twitter and Instagram, Facebook, and other platforms, feminists weaponized their outrage and cancel culture, seeking to enforce their ideological conformity through online activism. You shut up or you agree with us. That's the kind of, that's the kind of love and tolerance that is now uh, permeating the left.
The Me Too movement was a perfect example of this that began in 2017. It was initially aimed to expose sexual harassment and assault like Harvey Weinstein, who deserves to be behind bars, and he deserves everything that was coming to him. But it quickly devolved into a platform where accusation alone could destroy someone's career and reputation and really just let us into cancel culture. While exposing abuse is commendable, of course, the movement's failure to uphold biblical principles of justice created a weapon of the system so that basically they just ruined people's lives. And it caused tons of danger and outrage in the social media world. Now, in addition, fourth wave feminism fully embraced the transgender movement. Of course, they did championing biological men who identify as women, uh, which led to controversies in things like sports, uh, where male athletes are now competing against women's athletes and displacing them and dominating them in their own sports. Feminists like Judith Butler and organizations like the ACLU endorsed these policies, claiming that no harm had been done to biological women, which is astounding. What was once a movement that advocated for women's rights now cheer as dudes are pummeling women in the MMA world and beating them to within an inch of their life and winning and all in the all in the guise of what's great for women. It's so foolish. Fourth wave feminism also amplified intersectionality to such an extreme that it fractured itself into smaller identity groups. Instead of uniting women under a common cause, all they've done is splintered women based off of race and gender identity and sexuality with each group vying for the status of the most oppressed. Feminists who fail to conform to racial transgender ideologies are often labeled as TERFs, trans exclusionary radical feminist which we've seen with uh the lady who wrote uh harry potter what's her name i know you're already saying it at home i don't remember because i don't care i don't read those books but people like her are ostracized by their own movement for defending the biological reality of womanhood this internal division and this no one can be as woke as me ism has caused so much division and credibility crisis and incoherence in the feminist cause that honestly i believe that that we're watching it implode praise god we're watching it fall apart i don't think it can last much longer moreover fourth wave feminism's elevation of lived experience over objective reality fosters a culture where feelings became the highest authority and that's not just true of feminism that's true of our entire snowflake culture Universities, once center of intellectual debate, became echo chambers of feminist and progressive orthodoxy, where safe spaces and trigger warnings now shield students from ideas that might challenge their fragile, fragile worldview. This rejection of reason and truth is, is a direct affront to biblical wisdom, Proverbs 14, 15, and it undermines our ability as humans to be even to discern right from wrong because we have to constantly be propped up by somebody so that, so that our egos don't shatter. Where our society now today doesn't even know basic biological facts such as man and womanhood. Both third and fourth wave feminism has represented a full-scale war on reality. I've given plenty of examples so far, but also a war on God and a war on God's order and a war on God's design. As these movements collapse and praise God that they will, under the weight of their own mountain of contradictions, they leave behind a society which is fractured by their own confusion and rebellion, which is where we as Christians need to come in and, and rebuild. The cultural chaos that we see today is the direct result from feminism. The rejection of biblical values, the sanctity of life or the lack thereof, and the God-given distinction between male and female are a direct result of feminism poisoning our society. And for a moment, I want to just give you a few examples of how this has happened because there's legion of examples, but I do want to give you a few of how feminism has infiltrated our modern world. And I want to share these with you so that you'll see it, so that you'll know it, so that you'll be able to point to it and say, yeah, that's feminism, and also so that you will war against it because it needs to be crippled part two examples of feminism in our culture now like i said modern feminism far from a mere quest for equality has reached disturbing new heights pushing society into chaos confusion and moral insanity 
The movement now embraces radical ideologies that defy biology, undermine traditional values, obliterate fundamental truths, and just are stupid. Sure, let, me, let me give you a few examples. Leah Thomas. Leah Thomas is one of the most blatant examples of modern day feminism's impact on the hatred and the war against women. If you're not familiar, Leah Thomas is a biological male with a penis. He didn't get it chopped off yet, apparently, who's competing in women's sports at the University of Pennsylvania in the swimming program. Thomas displaced female athletes who got scholarships to go to this university because he was a subpar loser in the men's sport. He couldn't win anything. So what does he do? He puts on a one piece bathing suit and now he's a national champion in the women's world. It's unbelievable. Feminism's unyielding support for transgenderism includes the fact that he has to undress in front of the women in in the locker room so that they have to be naked in front of him. And this is somehow liberating to women that not only does he with his testosterone elevated self get to whip the floor with them or the swimming pool with them. And then he has to gloat in front of them, whipping his penis around the locker room so that they have to see that this is who beat you. This is what they're calling a woman. It's disgusting. It's unbelievable. And the Democrats, including house speaker, Nancy Pelosi continue to push policies like this that allow transgender athletes to dominate women and marginalize biological girls in spaces that they have, that's supposed to be safe. Here's another example, Katanji Brown Jackson. If you're not familiar with her, she is the 2022 Supreme Court confirmation who, who now is a member of the Supreme Court. Katanji Jackson in her, in her hearing was asked to define what a woman is, and she said she could not provide an answer because she doesn't have a biology degree. This is a woman who's sitting on the Supreme Court of the United States of America and doesn't even know how to define what a woman is. And she's one of them. This moment exposed the intellectual stupidity, the moral insanity, the the downgrade that has come into this country by feminism. Here's another example. What is a woman by Matt Walsh? Matt Walsh just came out with a new documentary this week. Am I a racist? Well, his original one was what is a woman? If you have not seen it, go check it out. It came out in 2022. It is brilliant. Matt Walsh shines a harsh light on modern feminism stupidity. He, he basically goes around and he asks feminists and academics to define woman, and none of them can. He asks women on the street, what is a woman? They can't define it. The so-called experts and the population could not answer a simple question of what is a woman? Under feminist pressure, under, under a newfound uh, reality that the education and mainstream media and Hollywood is pushing, the idea that a woman can't be defined is now basically accepted as truth. And now we're living in a society that's been subjected to the absurd idea that gender is fluid. That's so stupid. Water is a fluid. Oil that goes in my car is a fluid. Milk is a fluid. It's great with chocolate chip cookies, but gender is not fluid. Gender is fixed. Gender is a binary. You're either male or you're female. It's not subjective. It's objective. When the doctor looks down and sees a vagina, he doesn't say, well, they're going to have to figure it out one day. They're going to have to decide what gender they are. This is foolishness. And it's not just a, a crisis of common sense, which most certainly it is. The politicians like Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, and all of them have embraced this confusion, not because they actually believe it. They don't believe it. They're pandering to you. They're playing this whole thing out to gain power, to legitimize this harmful ideology so that they can basically break our country. You've got to wake up. If, if you believe this stuff, and, and I don't think anybody who watches this show does, I'm just, I'm frustrated because this is so crazy that we're even living in a country where people don't know what a woman is. I am just in, I'm in awe and I'm baffled. I, I literally can't understand this. 
Here's another example. The San Francisco spa incident in 2021, where a biological male went in uh, into a spa and exposed himself in front of women on purpose in front of young girls, igniting outrage. And the spa itself said that he had a right to be there that he had a right to be there because he identifies as a woman, jeopardizing the safety and the dignity of women. Then you have feminist democratic politicians like AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who push these insane policies and argue that men have a right to be in women's most sacred spaces. And all it's doing is advancing a war on womanhood. Feminism is not about empowering women, it's about destroying women. It's been proven over the years. It's shown its ugly head. It is not for the good of women. It is for their destruction. And why would Satan and why would the demons and why would these movements like feminism, which is thoroughly baked in the sulfur pits of hell, why would they want to go after women? Because women are the ones who bring life to the world. Women's are the, women are the ones who who take the things, the raw materials that that men give them, and they turn them into culture and life and societies and and flourishing. So if you can take out the very most important people in our society, which are mothers, if you can take them out, the rest of the society will fall and collapse right along with it. It's been a common theme, right? With climate crisis, why are they doing it? They're doing it to erode our society. With open borders, why are they doing it? They're doing it to erode our society. In every single one of these episodes, what I hope you're noticing is that the Democrats want to destroy America because as America becomes more divided, they get more power. And then when it's time to hand America over, when it's finally been destroyed and decimated, when they hand it over to the globalist, they will get their reward. That's what is happening. If you don't believe me, just watch, just wait. That is where America is heading and we have to stop it. Here's another example, men and women's prisons. In 2021, Governor Gavin Newsom passed a law allowing biological men who identify as women to be housed in women's prisons, which great idea, right? They identify as as women, so they must be real girls, right? Well, here's what happened. (laughs) Those men who identified as women began sexually assaulting female inmates. Female inmates became pregnant by their supposed female identifying inmate counterpart. And you have abortions happening in the prison from female inmates impregnating female inmates. Do you see what, how stupid that is? Feminists in their ideological fervor have supported a policy that makes no sense with reality. You put a man in a women's prison, he's going to do what he does because he's in, he's not a good man. He's not a righteous man. He's a man who's basically trying to get into a female prison so that he can basically sexually assault women or just have sex with a bunch of them. That was his entire goal. And the Democrats knew that and they put those women at risk by signing such a stupid law into uh, into the books. Like I said, Governor Gavin Newsom, a Democrat, signed the law and he illustrated how the Democrats' blind pursuit of gender equality leads to dangerous, irrational situations for women. And they do not protect the people that they're claiming to protect. Think about drag queen story hour just for a moment. Public libraries across the country have hosted these drag queen story hours where fat men in dresses shake their rear ends in front of women and children. And that's supposed to be liberating. That's supposed to be the the picture of womanhood. This is why, by the way, our church did pastor story hour where we went into the library and we told children that that there's only two genders and fat men in dresses are not godly and that we should avoid them at all costs. And actually, if we lived in a moral society, a man who puts on a dress and gets breast implants so that he can shake his fake boobs in front of women and children in order to sexualize babies and toddlers and little girls and boys, a man who does that in a job society would be hanging by the tallest oak tree in the in the absolute square of our town so that everyone could look at that evil wretch and say i never want that to happen to me and i would tell you what if we lived in a just society where public hangings came back you would not have this problem 
you would not have feminist and their Hollywood allies and drag queen story hours. And you wouldn't have Michelle Obama, also known as Michael, do your own research on that, who are championing events like this as inclusive, despite how inappropriate and disgusting and sexualized and seedy they are. If you had public hanging, you should get rid of this instantly. But we're more refined than that these days. Feminism's obsession with gender fluidity has paved the way for the normalization of exposing minors to adult themed performances, sexualizing children. And I pray to God that the people who do these things will be destroyed. And I mean that. When David prayed that his enemies would be destroyed by God because they were wicked, I'm praying that drag queens, I'm praying that the kinds of people who are doing these kinds of things, that they will be destroyed. And that in the ashes of the society that they burned to the ground, that the Christian church can rebuild. Here's another example. In Texas, there was a custody battle between a mother and a father. It was a high profile case where the mother was pushing the son to be transitioned into a girl, all while trying to keep it away from the father so that he didn't, he didn't know about it until it was too late. Feminists have, con have consistently supported uh, women in situations like this to take custody away from fathers who are fighting for their boys' penises not to be cut off. This is astounding. But figures like Hillary Clinton have endorsed these policies of stripping parents of their rights and to safeguard their children from dangerous, irreversible treatments like this. Think about Rachel Levine, who is another fat man in a dress who is not the picture of health, but the picture of insanity. In 2021, Joe Biden elected or appointed this man who is a biological male who identifies as a woman to be appointed to the assistant secretary for health. I want you to think about that. A man dressing up as a woman who believes that he is a biological female is now the secretary for health. God help this stupid and ignorant and foolish country it, because we have no freaking idea what health actually means. A man who promotes puberty blockers for, for children, gender transition for minors, that is disgusting and deeply troubling, yet feminists celebrate this as a victory for women's rights. Feminism's alignment with transgender ideology has just further divided the country and destroyed the foundations of morality. Democratic leaders celebrate it. They celebrate pigs in dresses like Rachel Levine and their appointment as endorsing policies that are now that are now good for women and they're and are about the health and safety of children. This is so just so, so stupid. Honestly. Every week I do these episodes, like I want so bad to get back to the Bible, to be talking about the book of Revelation. I'm, I'm so looking forward to that series where we can talk about that, where we can talk about what the Bible says, because I'm so sick and tired of talking about these people that I can't for the life of me understand how they have power. I, I honestly, I can't understand it. The, what they're doing to children, what they're doing to women, what they're doing to men, what they're doing to the society. I don't understand how they have power. The Democratic Party, through its embrace of radical feminism, has become the engine that is driving our culture off the cliff. They're, it's like they're playing a game of hot potato when the music of the cultural decay finally stops. They're going to be the one holding the potato. They're going to be the ones who are responsible for the moral decay of our society, for the burning it of it all the way to the ground. And the evidence is undeniable. From erasing biological distinctions, from promoting transgender policies, Democrats have shown that they are the party of extreme insanity and feminism. Leaders like Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez have championed all of this crap that's prioritized gender identity over reality, self-empowerment over moral responsibility, emotional fragility over free speech. And by advancing all of this, the Democratic Party is complicit in the downfall of America. They, they brought in systems that were once cloaked in the language of equality and rights. And now that's metastasized into a heaping pile of chaos that has undermined truth, dismantled the family and pushed America deeper and deeper and deeper into decay. 
which leads us to our final point today. Because if you're going to look to this society to tell you what a woman is, you may as well put a 44 Magnum to your mouth because you're going to have a better outcome than trying to get our society to help you understand what a woman is. I know that's extreme, but our society is extreme. Their views are extreme. Their views are literally destroying human bodies and destroying our society right in front of our very eyes. And I don't think most people realize just how damning and how damaging it is. I don't think, I think we've been lulled to sleep. I think we've, we've basically been desynthesized to how bad it actually is. It's bad right now. It's bad. So what I'd like to do now in the final time that we've got is I want to talk about the biblical view of womanhood. I want to talk about what does the Bible say about womanhood because the Bible and God are the only sources of truth that we can actually listen to about what a woman is because frankly, God's the only one nowadays who knows what a woman is. So we need to go to his book to find this out. And we need to begin not by talking about womanhood, actually. We need to begin with by talking about the foundation of male headship, because to understand what a woman is, we need to understand what headship is. So we need to talk about that first. So with that, let's transition into our final section where we talk about what is a woman biblically. Part three, the biblical view of womanhood, the foundation of male headship. Now, to rightly understand biblical womanhood, as I said before, we must begin with the doctrine of headship, which lies at the heart of God's design for order and for beauty and for human flourishing. Scripture reveals a instituted hierarchy where men are appointed by God as leaders in the family and in the church and in society, and they're to bring a kind of selfless, sacrificial love and responsibility to these spheres to influence them for good. They are to be the gatekeepers as women do the most precious and glorious work inside the gates. The structure, far from oppressive, promotes peace, and it promotes order, and it promotes a godly living that God himself gave to us for our flourishing. God himself made male and female, and he blessed male and female, and he called male and female very good in the roles that he originally designed. In contrast, a rejection of male headship, which is evidence in movements like modern day feminism, ushers in disorder and chaos and confusion. Now, like we just said a second ago, headship was established at creation. The foundation of male headship is not a cultural construct. The foundation of male leadership is not pragmatism or what we think works best. It was created by God. Genesis 1 through 2 teaches us that Adam was formed first, and he was entrusted with the responsibility of tending the garden and receiving God's direct commandments, Genesis 2, 7 and verse 18 through 24. I want you to hear that. Adam received the commandments of God first. Then Eve was made as Adam's helper. Then Adam shared the commands with her, which meant that Adam was supposed to be the leader of the relationship. He brought the commandments of God to her and was tasked with teaching her what God requires. Eve's role was a helper to Adam, complimenting him, not competing with him or trying to usurp his authority and leadership. Adam named Eve in Genesis 2.23, which highlights his authority in the relationship, and it's further established by the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 2.12-13, where he grounds male leadership in creation, where he says that males were called by God to be the leaders of families and the leaders of churches and the leaders of society, and he roots that in creation. Now, headship was also confirmed after the fall of man. After we sinned, headship was reaffirmed. The fall, which is detailed in Genesis 3, reinforces the principle of male headship. Although Eve was deceived first, God goes after Adam, and he holds Adam accountable for the breach in leadership, Genesis 3, 9. And Paul clarifies this in Romans 5, 12 through 19, when he says that sin entered the world through Adam, not through Eve, which is astounding. Remember, Eve 
was the one who took the fruit first, ate the fruit first, and yet the Bible says that sin entered the world through Adam because Adam was the leader, which means that all of the responsibility of Eve's sin fell on him. This underscores the profound spiritual responsibility that's been placed on men in order to lead their households towards righteousness. You think about it in the Navy, for instance, if you have a, a if you have a submarine and the captain is the one who's in charge of the boat and he's sleepy and he needs to go to bed and he tells one of the, you know, the seamen on the boat to, hey, you drive us back to port. I'm going to be asleep for a moment. And the seaman crashes the boat. It's the seaman's fault. He crashed the boat, and yet it's the captain who will be held responsible. It's the captain who will probably lose his commission over something like that. It's because headship and leadership assumes responsibility when things are broken. Adam's failure to protect his wife affected the entire human race by unleashing sin upon all of us because we sinned in Adam. Now, male headship is not about authoritarian control like Kim Jong-il or Vladimir Putin, but it's Christ-like. It's sacrificial leadership. It's leadership that's modeled and based off of how Jesus led his church. See, the New Testament presents Christ as the pinnacle of male headship. He's the true and better Adam, which means that we ought to imitate his leadership in our leadership. His leadership, marked by humility and service and not dominance, is what we're called to lead our lives like. We're called to prioritize their well-being. We're to sacrifice for them. We're to give ourselves up for them like Jesus gave himself up for his bride, the church. True headship involves putting others' needs above your own and guiding them and washing them and caring for them and living for them and providing for them and protecting them and so that they can grow in grace and truth. So, in fact, headship is not this sort of toxic masculinity or domineering patriarchy. Headship is supposed to be the greatest blessing that women have ever received. Because everything they want, safety, security, love, acceptance, and a place where they can cultivate the life and the family and all of that, the the protection and the provision to do that should be provided by male headship. Paul says that if you don't provide for your family, you're worse than an unbeliever. A male, a godly biblical male is supposed to bring protection and provision to his wife so that she can do the greatest work of all, which is bring life to his tribe. Now, headship is demonstrated in the family and also in the church. The order of male leadership is clearly prescribed in the Bible and in the church and in society. In 1 Corinthians 11, 3, Paul teaches that the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He does not say that if there's a woman who has stronger leadership acumen than her husband, that that woman should lead her husband and he should submit to her. No, every single man on earth is a head. Every, every married man, especially the question is whether he's going to be a good head or a bad head, because the Bible says that the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. You can't get around that. That's actually what the words on the page say. You're either a good head or you're a bad head. You either have good leadership or you have bad leadership. This is what man is called to bar none. You can't get around it. And this leadership entails both spiritual guidance and care. It's husbands who are called to nurture the faith of their households and to lead them into more and more righteousness and maturity and godliness and blessing. Likewise, in the church, scripture firmly upholds that there's only one kind of person who can be in positions of teaching and authority, and it's not females, it's males. In 1 Timothy 2, 12 through 14, women are prohibited from exercising authority over men in the church, which affirms that the office of elder and pastor and deacon are reserved for qualified men. Now, if you think about it like that, 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 that there's, that this is set up and in place, you should assume that there's consequences if we forsake this divine order, which is what feminism has done. They've rejected male headship. They've rejected female submission. And because of that, there's consequences. Well, let's talk about that for a second. Whenever male headship is rejected, disorder and chaos creep in as seen from the very beginning, when Adam was passive in leading Eve, he led, it led to the fall of mankind. 
kind, where today feminism's rejection of biblical submission has produced similar consequences. It's fractured families. It's led to widespread fatherlessness and immorality in society. Isaiah 3.12 illustrates the disastrous effects of improper male leadership when it says that women and children were usurping the role of men, which led to the nation's ruin. Biblical male headship is essential for the flourishing of both the family and society. And that's what I want to talk about next is male leadership in society, because you have many people will say that women should go out and get a job or they should go work in boardrooms and become CEOs and presidents and they should go into the military, the Navy, the Air Force, whatever. I, I'm here to tell you. The scope of male headship extends beyond the home and it extends beyond the church and it goes even into society where men are called to lead in governance, in civic responsibilities, and even in warfare. From the leaders chosen in Deuteronomy 1, 13 through 15, who were all men, to the elders at the city gates in the book of Ruth, which is in Ruth 4, 1 through 2, Scripture consistently portrays men as the primary leaders in their domain. And maybe you would say, look at Esther and Deborah. Well, Deborah never fights in any wars in the narrative. She's a mother to Barak. She's a woman who judges the nation based off of her mothering them. And it's, it's funny, it's even in the book of Hebrews that Barak is the one who is praised as the leader of Israel, not, not Deborah. And then if you look at Esther, Esther doesn't do anything on her own. She doesn't lead anything. She gets put into a harem at the beginning of the book, and she gets chosen because of her beauty to be Ahasuerus' wife. And through her, through her feminine way of loving him and serving him and making meals and parties and hospital, through her feminine way, she, she basically influences and helps Ahasuerus come to the truth that he needs to murder Haman because Haman is a wicked dude. She doesn't make any decisions in the book. She basically is a model role of a wife to a pagan man, and she influences him to make the right decision. But it's he who makes the decision. It's he who makes the decrees. It's he who has the signet ring and the scepter and the rule and the authority. It's not Esther. The two biggest examples of female leadership in the Bible are not examples of female leadership in society at all. Those women are operating in godly feminine ways to come alongside of men to help men make the choices and the decisions that are going to influence society. Deuteronomy 22.5 even forbids women from adopting roles that are specifically designed for men, such as military duties. Women are told not to wear the clothing of men because that would be an abomination. Well, what is the clothing of men? A business suit, a military uniform, a helmet. The, you, you think about what is the uniform of a man? What's an abomination if a woman wears that uniform? I know that's controversial. I know that because of feminism, we have taken women outside of the home and put them into the workplace. But I'm tired of pretending like the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible has such an incredible and beautiful and glorious role for women. Why would we dare put them out into society and, and have them neglect the most important job on earth? We're out there working so that she can do her greatest effort. We're working so that we can support her. Think about it like this. I was in the military. Imagine that you're in an absolute firefight and over about a hundred yards away from you is the medical tent where there's a surgeon who's doing their work. And that surgeon is trying to patch up soldiers that you need to get back into the battle. You would not walk into that medical tent and take that surgeon by the collar and say, you know what, you need to put down your scalpel and you need to grab an M16 and you need to come out there with us and help us fight the war. That, if you did that, that would be foolish or it would be an absolute live or die situation. No, you would go out there and fight your butt off so that that soldier or so that that surgeon could do their work because their work is highly skilled and it's bringing life to the troops so that you can have more people to fight the war. In the same way, why would we bring our women outside of the homes and take them from the more important work so that they could come out there and fight with us in society and make a paycheck? God forbid the paycheck if that's what we're going to do. May we all starve and, and be, and be uh, and plunged into ruin if we take our precious women 
and put them into a society to grovel and compete with men. That's not the point. We're out there fighting so that she can do the most important work on earth. And if she joins us, then we're all doomed. Now, before we end our topic of headship, we need to talk about Christ who is, again, the supreme model of headship. Male headship is a reflection of Jesus. It's a reflection of his authority and his love for his church. In Colossians 1.18 and Ephesians 5.23, Christ is presented as the head of the church. He leads her. He loves her. He cares for her. He provides for her. His bride receives unmatched love and support and sacrifice because of him. That is, brothers, that's what we have to do for our wives. If your family can't function on one income, you need to get a second job so that your wife can stay at home and do the most important work that God has called her to do. Don't send your wife out into the world to work and send your children to daycare. Do you know that most women work just so that they can afford to pay for daycare? At the end of the day, they're working just so they can afford to send their children to someone else to raise them. What is the sense in that? I know story after story of women who, at the end of the matter, they may be netted $200, $300 a week because daycare costs them every dime that they made. Brothers, don't let your wife do that. Reject that lie and work your butt off so that that woman can stay at home and do the work that only she can do. We have to live like Christ. He did the work that he could do so that he could empower us to do the work that we can do. He died for us. He stood at the gate. He took the punishment that we deserve. So why? So that we could go into all the world with his blessings and share them with the rest of the world. That's exactly the picture of what the male and female relationship is in the Bible. We go out into the world to sacrifice ourselves for our family so that she so that she can take the blessings and share them with a people. We must do that work. Rejecting that headship model is a rejection of the authority of God and the picture of Christ himself. God's design for headship is not arbitrary, but it's a reflection of his own nature and the order by which he created the cosmos. When men lead like Christ led, selflessly, sacrificially, and all of that, they reflect the very heart of God. And brothers, I call you to it. Live like that, lead like that, love like that, and serve like that. Amen. All right, now. Before we end, let's talk about the biblical view of womanhood. We started by talking about headship, and you have to talk about headship before you can understand what a woman is, because a woman is to thrive under the headship of a godly man. So we had to talk about that first. Now, let's talk about the biblical view of womanhood. From the very beginning, womanhood is revealed as a unique and vital part of God's perfect design. She is a glorious thing. She's a beautiful thing. She's a precious thing. Genesis 1.27 tells us God created man, which is male and female, in his own image, and he called them very good. The Hebrew word for image there is salem, which speaks to the inherent dignity and worth of both male and female who are sharers in the likeness of God. Yet, within this shared image bearing, God also distinguishes their roles. They are equal in their person, but they are different in their role. And together, male playing the male part, female playing the female part, they reflect the glory of God. If the females jump ship and join the male team, then you have cacophony. But if he plays his part, and if she plays her part like a beautiful symphony orchestra, you have this glorious melody that wafts its way up to heaven and is a pleasure and is a pleasing aroma to God who made it. The woman in Genesis 2.18 is described as a helper who has been fit for her man. A phase, a phrase that conveys profound strength and purpose and fitness. The word ezer is often used to describe God as a helper to his people. So a woman being a helper to her people is not a sign of her weakness, but it's a sign of her strength. Psalm 33, 20 describes God as the helper to the people of Israel, showing that the role of woman is far from a passive, insignificant, and, and, and just indispensable 
or, or dispensable second class citizen. No, it's a powerful role. It's a beautiful role. It's a godly role where she's partnering with man to bring life to a community of people. The act of creating woman out of man's rib also shows us something about her purpose in Genesis 2.22. She is not made out of the head of Adam so that she could rule over him. She is not made out of the feet of Adam so that he could dominate her. She's made out of his rib so that they could be side by side, heart to heart, and working together in their equal and yet distinct roles to bring about the glory of God. This symbolizes their closeness and the equality of their personhood, yet with the difference and the distinguishing factor of their different roles. This complementary design is further expounded in Ephesians 5, 22 through 24, where Paul explains that the relationship between a husband and a wife actually magnifies and declares the gospel of Jesus Christ. When a man is being what a man is called to be, and when a woman is being what a woman is called to be, their relationship as a marriage is magnifying the mystery of the gospel to a world that is lost in confusion. And I pray, and I pray, that the world would see that picture clearly in Christian marriages instead of us acquiescing and being defined by what the feminists have taught us. Here's another thing. The Greek word for submission here, hypotasso, does not imply forced subjugation, but a willing, voluntary alignment of one's life with another for the sake of unity and harmony and life. Just as Christ's headship over the church is marked by sacrificial love, so too is the man to be characterized by selfless care for his bride, devotion to her, protection of her, care for her, provision to her. He is to live his life for her good. This mutual respect and love creates an environment where both men and women can flourish according to their God-given design. And dear Lord, do we need to see that today. Now, before we end, let's talk about the beauty and the glory of womanhood. Biblical womanhood is not just a concept that was created in creation, which we just talked about. Biblical womanhood is not a position of inferiority or insignificance, but it's one of beauty, strength, and honor. The Proverbs 31 woman is the quintessential picture, the archetype of godly femininity, where where she is the one who is working in her fields. It's her field. She's not going out into the workforce. She's working in her home. She's working in her fields. She's clothing her children. She's taking the resources that her husband has given her and she's multiplying them for the sake of life. She is the one who has done her job so well that her husband is known in the city gates. Her children rise up and call her blessed. She is the picture of godly feminine love and care. Now notice it's her husband who's in the gates. He's the one who's working out in the world so that why? So that she can do her most precious work at home and she's done it so well and she's multiplied life so diligently in that home that he's known even out in the gates. It's a beautiful image. And she also exemplifies how biblical womanhood encompasses strength, intelligence, and grace. Ephesians 5, 22 through 24 further reveals that submission in marriage is not about losing your identity or losing your value or losing your voice. The Greek word for love that's used in this passage is agape or agape signifies a self-sacrificial love that seeks the well-being of another. If men would love their wives like this, there would never be a wife on earth who would ever complain again. And here's the thing. There is no husband who's going to measure up to Christ. But wives, the Bible doesn't give us an exception clause where the only way we can submit to a man is if we're married to Jesus. As men are striving to become more like Christ, and they should strive for that, and they must strive for that, and you can encourage them to strive for that. But as they're doing that, you strive to be more and more like the picture of God's church when she had no longer has any spot or stain or wrinkle. That church that exists in the eschaton where Christ is returned and that church is surrounding him and always submitting to him for an eternity. Do you know, ladies? that you get the opportunity to practice what all of us are going to be doing in heaven for all of eternity, submitting to our husband. You get to tell the story today 
of what heaven is going to be like tomorrow in the way that you submit to your husband. If you're submitting to him poorly or if you're not submitting to him at all, you're not telling the picture of heaven and the gospel. You're telling the picture of hell, which is filled with rebels and people who won't submit to authority at all. Submission, therefore, is an act of generosity that tells the story of the gospel. It's a role of great dignity, and it mirrors Christ's submission to his own father and our submission to him. And it is a high calling to be a woman and to be a mother and to be a worker in the home. Motherhood is presented in the scripture as, as the, one of the most sacred and the highest callings that have ever been given to a person. Titus 2, 3 through 5 encourages older women, therefore, to teach what is good, to train younger women on how to love their husbands and children because it's a gift to society. When God calls women to teach other women how to be good wives, workers at home, lovers of husband and lovers of children, it's because that vision is so good that Paul wanted to make sure that communities never forgot it. He was telling older women to teach the younger women what is good because women are to be entrusted with a moral and a spiritual role in their family that is irreplaceable. Far from being restrictive, the role of wife and mother elevates a woman to a position of profound influence. The, the person who has the most influence in all the world is not the president, it's not the pope, it's not the emperor, it's not the Hollywood A-lister, it's the mother who is raising literally the next generation, influencing them on who they're going to become that's going to shape society and it's going to shape the world. Motherhood extends far beyond the biological bearing of children. In 1 Timothy 2.15, Paul writes that women will be saved through childbearing. He says women will be saved through childbearing, which is a passage that's often misunderstood, but it's in the Bible, so we have to look at it. The Greek word there is technogonia, which refers not merely to the act of actually pushing a baby out of your body, but to the nurturing of and raising of a child. This calling is not limited to, to just the physical act of pushing the baby out, but it's, but it's the whole life of teaching and imparting wisdom and virtue and discipling and caring so that through your leadership and through your influence and through your home, the world is actually going to have life brought to it because of you. This is a high calling. And it's a reflection of God's own nurturing character and his, and his care for women that he would give them such a beautiful and glorious role. Showing that women participate in the most important divine work that we have here on earth, which is the raising and the shaping of future generations, the fear and admonition of the Lord. Contrary to the claims of feminism, which often sees the home as a noose around a woman's neck, the household is a powerful role, the most powerful role with eternal consequence and significance. The home is where godly values are inculcated, where children learn about Christ and where the light of the gospel shines in the everyday bits of life. Proverbs 14, one says the wise woman builds her house, but the foolish one tears it down with her own hands. A godly woman who loves and cares for her husband and her children builds her home, builds her community, builds up societies and populates nations. The biblical vision of womanhood also emphasizes inner beauty and strength, qualities that transcend her outward appearance. Peter in 1 Peter 3, 3 through 4, exhorts women not to focus on their external adornments, on the dresses and on the hair and on the jewelry and on the makeup and all of those things, but to focus on the hidden person of the heart because that is where true beauty is found. Paul or Peter is saying that women inherently have a kind of beauty about them, a kind of glory about them that should be treated as an adornment. Ornament. And it points to the idea of ordering one's life according to God's purposes is beautiful. The inner beauty that Peter describes is cultivated through a quiet and a gentle spirit. Qualities that reflect Christ's own meekness and submission to his father as well. Women who are quiet, submissive, and who are cultivating godliness are the most beautiful people on earth. It is astounding to me that Satan has traded in that kind of beauty 
for beauty that can be found at uh, through a tube of makeup or what I don't know much about makeup, uh, whatever, through makeup and through uh, clothing and through sexuality. And beauty is not found there. Beauty is found in the inner strength, the inner quietness and the meekness of a heart that is submitted to God. You want to be a woman of beauty, be that. The Greek word there for gentle is often used to describe a horse that has been tamed, suggesting that that there's great strength, but it's been bridled and it's been and it's been directed by God in a humble and a glorious way. Being a woman is not about abandoning your talents. It's about taking your talents and bridling them and directing them for the glory of God. And this strength enables women to endure hardships, to serve others, to trust in God's sovereign care, no matter what the circumstances, so that they can lead their family. Without a woman, without a strong biblical woman, families die, families fail, and families are plunged into ruin. As you can tell, there's so much that we can talk about when it comes to this topic. But as we close... We need to reject feminism, feminism to the glory of God. Every aspect of what feminism has said has been wrong. And at its core, feminism promotes a rebellion against God's design for men and women. And it advocates a kind of autonomy and self-determination that breaks things apart. And that's what we're seeing in our society. Everything is being broken because feminism has redefined basic reality. The movement's celebration of abortion as their own sacrament, the sacrifice that takes away their sins, that's the gospel of feminism, that if you sin and you sleep with someone and you get pregnant, there's a sacrifice for you. Instead of the firstborn son of God being killed, your firstborn son will be killed in your own womb. And that's a sacrament of this bloody, unholy, godless movement. It violates the command, you shall not murder, Exodus 20, 13, disregards the sanctity of human life for the unborn, and it celebrates the same sin that, that they not only do them, but they give hearty approval to those who too, which is Romans 1, 32 through 34. The exaltation of autonomy over submission has led to the erosion of the family. True freedom for women is is not found in rebellion, but in embracing God's design. Biblical womanhood is a path to peace. It is a path to fulfillment. It is a path to eternal significance where she nurtures her household, nurtures her home, strengthens her community. This is the vision that the church of Jesus Christ must uphold and must promote. And I get it that there's a lot of women who've never been taught this before. And there's a lot of women who are going to listen to what I'm saying, and they're going to think that is so oppressive, that is so misogynistic, that is so backward. And all I'm doing, sisters and brothers, is I'm quoting the Bible. The church has to encourage women to stop thinking along the categories that have been given to us by first, second, third, and fourth wave feminism. And what I've been noticing actually is that most women, most women, most godly Christian women don't believe in feminism, which is praise the Lord for that. But our culture has been so defined by feminism that there's subtle little ways that feminism has actually infiltrated the thinking of women and men and churches and society that we also need to repent of. Women should not go to war. That's not the role that we want to give to our women. Women are life givers, they're not life takers. Women are the one who take the protection that's offered to them by men and they make life. We don't send them out into the battlefield to fight our wars for us. That's as backward as anything that I can possibly imagine. Conclusion, why voting Democrat is a sin. In light of everything that we've discussed, it is abundantly clear that feminism now which has been fully embraced and championed by the democratic party represents rebellion against god and against man and it needs to be thoroughly rejected and voting for a party that is all in on feminism is not only a direct endorsement for these ideologies but it's a turning away from god himself it's a sin against god it's a sin against womanhood it's a sin against the family it's a sin against our nation if you vote for a party that supports this kind of horse manure then you You are sinning against multiple groups of people, not less God. 
Feminism through its pursuit of autonomy, sexual liberation, and destruction of gendered roles has led to the erosion of our society, and we must repent of it before it is too late. Now, with that, I want to thank you so much for watching another episode of the podcast. This was a long one, and it was a long one on purpose because we needed to dive into these demonic doctrines so that we could be equipped. Men, I want you to work your butts off so that your wives can flourish in the home. Women, I want you to be the kind of godly women that tell the story of Christ in his church. And brothers and sisters, together, let us demonstrate to the onlooking world the hope that we have in Christ so that feminism will die, society will heal, and Christendom will come again. Brothers and sisters, that's all I've got. I'm exhausted. I'm going to bed. God bless you. We'll see you next time on the podcast. Now get out of here. See you next time.